Welcome to the Millennial Method Podcast, where I dive into the personal stories of millennials that have decided to chase their dreams, overcome challenges, and redefine success in this pivotal era. I'm your host, Marky, and my guest for today is Evan Lee. He is the head of partnerships and business development at Motion Creative Analytics, which is a performance creative hub. It supercharges your team's workflow to bridge the gap between media buyers and creatives. A lot of marketing speak there, I know. Um, but essentially what it is, is if you ever seen those TikTok ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, this tool help is designed to help you understand why those ads are effective or ineffective. And I wanted to bring them on because we're both in the same industry, this industry of advertising. For those that don't know, I work for a boutique digital agency where I help entrepreneurs, startups, businesses, brands grow their business in the digital world. And, you know, I'm very passionate about this work because I, I think it's a really fun job. Um, you know, my role is a creative strategist. Sounds kind of cool. Um, but essentially what it is, is, you know, I help, you know, design these ads. I write the copy. I, you know, I lead a creative team to help make really cool ads and winning ads at that, um, profitable ads. And so me and Evan talk about this role and, you know, I, I see this as a potential career path for a lot of creative people and analytical people, but I know I have a creative audience. So I want to talk to you guys, um, especially for the video editors out there. I think there's a lot of potential here for big business to, you know, really go out of your comfort zone and test your editing chops to create really cool ads for brands. You know, um, you know, I know a lot of, a lot of people out there are more traditionally trained on the video side and uh, if you ever wanted to explore marketing a little bit this creative strategist role i think is would be a nice nice role for you um even designers are copywriters and we go really deep into this role so i think you'll learn a lot if you're interested in that kind of thing and then we also just talk about life and the tendencies of creative people you know um even for myself you know like creative people are just we just love to dabble that's just the nature of who we are um could be a problem, sometimes could be a problem, but uh, Evan gives really sound advice on how to navigate around that. And so this was a very special episode to me uh, just because it talks about the daily work that I do. And Evan, I really appreciate you for hopping on and doing this. And so hope you guys enjoy. Um, and so without further ado, here's Evan Lee. Evan, my guy, what's up my brother? I'm excited to be here, man. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited you got the pod off the ground. It's killing it. I'm excited to be here, man. <laughs> I've known you for a good year now. I think uh, last time was October of 2022. And it's good to see you, man. I mean, there's a lot of people that they know I work for an agency, but have no idea what I do. Like, what does that even mean? Right. And it's like, I'm in this world of advertising and, you know, you're, you're also in this little small world. Um and just so many of my friends are just curious and I think they'll, they'll will be able to shed light in our, in our industry. Um, so but I think what I'd like to start off with is just, just going to say your name, you know, what you do and you know, what is motion, the company you work for. I got you. Well, first and foremost, thanks, man. I really mean <laughs> it. Whenever you call, you don't have to pull up. So we have to make that happen. But oh, everybody who's listening in, uh, my name is Evan Lee. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have all of your ears. I am the head of partnerships and business development at Motion. We'll definitely get into Motion some more, but at a high level, what we do is we help quantify creative impact. So it's like all of the great images, videos, and that kind of stuff. It's like, what's the true impact of that? And what revenue are you driving? So that's, that's a nutshell of what I do now. But in terms of my background, just to give like the high level summary of what got me to this point. I think the big thing to note is like I started my career on the brand marketing side at the at a Fortune 500 company, so a super large company, which is amazing. You get to see all the process, you get to work in structured environments to do a lot of good learning. But what also isn't so great about those environments is that there's a ton of red tape. So with red tape involved, you don't truly get to see the impact of your work and everything that's going on there. So decided to pack it up and uh, move from such a large company, and I knew I wanted to be in a smaller spot also being able to quantify some of the effort that I'm able to produce. So where that landed me to, as Market alluded to it, uh, is a marketing agency. So I landed at Shoelace, which is a marketing agency. I had a chance to run ads across a number of different clients, a number of different verticals at all different spend levels, 
which really allowed me to get into these like paid social platforms and like cut my teeth and understand the algorithms, work with clients, work with creative teams, all of the stuff that I'm sure we'll get into some more. Uh, and during my time actually running all of these ads, working with the teams and that good stuff, um, I realized that this company I'm at now, I was the buyer of this thing. So being able to land at a spot where it's just like a perfect fit, in all honesty, was a dream come true. And it was such a small company uh, at the time. And we are scaling um, where I really just had a chance to like take that impact to the next level. So it's been like a really fun ride. And it's been so fun to leverage it off the back of like quantifying creative effort, um, which I know that we'll get into some more. Of. Would you consider yourself a creative person? Would I consider myself a creative person? This is interesting because I think like in a in a traditional sense where it's like, you know, Evan, pick up a camera or, or do something along those lines. You're like, ah, not a chance. But the part that I consider creative in me is like the problem solving side. So it's like if there's a problem, what are ways to be creative about solving that problem? So it might not be a linear solution, but there might be a ton of jumps we have to make. Uh, and I quite like that. So like I like to draw the lines in the sand myself. I like to there's there's no rules in place, create the rules. If there are rules in place, bend the rules. Um, so that's the creative part, I'd say, rather than any visual element is where my head's at. I wanted to ask you that because, you know, you hear head of creative strategy and it's like, oh, he's probably some very creative design focused dude. Uh, but it's not that at all. I mean, you know, when you think about career paths, like it, it can even be a creative um, position, even if you're analytical. And I think you and what Motion is doing proves that, right? It's a nice little marriage. And so um, I wanted to set the stage before we go deep because, you know, we can go really deep on the uh, <laughs> jargon, um, but I just wanted to maybe give some simple things to think about because we're going to be talking about these words a lot um, and just kind of set the tone there. How's that sound? I'm down, man. Let's do it. Okay. So first of all, um, what is a media buyer? How would you explain a media buyer to somebody? A media buyer? Ah. Uh... So I think the first thing that I want to set the stage with, sorry to kind of take it off the rails. No, no, go ahead, man. It's all you. <laughs> before, we even, before we even take it to like the individual roles who are in place, kind of wanted to set the stage for like paid advertising in general when we throw that around. Like I know generically we say, yeah, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, TikTok ads, like all that kind of stuff. But for everyone who's tuned in, especially if you're on the creative side and you're contributing assets that might live in these ads, the biggest thing that I think of paid advertising as is distribution. So you've created this amazing piece of content. How do you get it in front of new audiences? That's the biggest thing when we're talking paid advertising, because really what we're doing is we're unlocking new eyeballs who then we engage with, whether that be through purchase, events, community, any of that kind of stuff. So now to go back to Mark's question of like, what is a media buyer, an individual role involved in paid advertising? A media buyer is a person who actually lives in these paid advertising platforms. So they are the people who are going to go into Facebook ad manager where you actually run the ads and they're going to be the ones who actually set up the structures of how you run it. It's like, Hey, step number one, do I want the goal of this campaign to be someone buy something? Do I just want them to view a page? Do I want them to submit their e email information? What's going on? So the easiest way I describe it is like they live in these advertising platforms and they kind of like tinker and understand what goes on there in the grand scheme of things. I love it. I love it. I should just have you set up this whole, this whole part of the, of the pod. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. So we talked about paid, paid media. Um, how's that different from, let's say organic. I think people have heard that before, but how would you, how would you differentiate the two? For sure. For sure. So organic, um, Organic or brand marketing, if we throw it into there, uh, actually probably not brand is the entire ethos of what a company does. So on the organic side, it's everything that doesn't have like money backing it essentially to get new eyeballs. So organic is really relevant to think of your own personal page, right? So it's like your own Facebook page. Why would you have that? But your own Instagram page, essentially. <laughs> and it's just like, if you're posting content there for the world to engage with, it's like, they're going to find you through their explore page, or they just might find you back in the day, like based on someone who liked your stuff right? So you're not paying a dollar to be able to get these new eyeballs, but they're finding you organically and then engaging. So that's the main difference I'd say, whereas paid is like, you're putting money to access new eyeballs who in any other world wouldn't have been able to hear about you essentially. Yep. 
And moving on from that, how would you dis- how would you um, describe D to C, this world of D to C, direct to consumer, direct response, advertising, all that bucket? Like, how would you describe that to a normal person? Yeah, D to C, direct to consumer for sure. Ecom, e-commerce businesses, yep. all that good all stuff. That. <laughs> it just really like when we think of when we think of direct to consumer e-commerce or anything along those lines, it's all in the name. It's literally direct to consumer. So we're cutting out the middleman in the grand scheme of things. So what that means is let's say I start a jewelry brand, right? And I start creating some jewelry. Before what I'd have to do is I'd have to go find retailers to just send it into their stores, make sure that they're able to sell it, they take profit, I take profit, and it gets split up. But in the direct-to-consumer world, what we're doing is we're empowering someone like myself, if I created a jewelry brand, for me to have direct access to that end customer. I no longer need an intermediary distribution piece to make that come to life. Essentially, what's happening there is I'm inviting them, whether it be organic or paid media, throwing back to that for them to get to know me. (laughs) And then what we can do is ultimately, um, if they buy from us, send it directly to them, building that one-to-one relationship instead of being blocked by an intermediary. So I'd say like, that's the best way I define it. But what do you think? Does that help? <laughs> that helps a ton. Yeah. Cause I'll be cool. saying stuff like D to C, you know, D to C ads. Uh, that makes no sense. So yeah. no, I appreciate that lens. <laughs> um, UGC. Cause I, th- I think that's a, that's a fun one uh, we can talk about. What, is, what does UGC mean in this world? UGC, user generated content. That's what we're looking at. I think like Everyone knew this to be influencer. If we look back five years or so, where it's just like the famous people who create some, uh, like get photos of them wearing some popular stuff and then like the brands just maximize that. But UGC has allowed a lot of like individual actors or an individual micro influencers to really step up to the plate. So UGC is user generated content. Uh, User generated content is then created by a creator at that point. And then what it's typically meaning is like the individual person is shooting content that seems very organic across multiple platforms, across the entire experience, rather than anything super staged or lever- or leveraging uh, like their likeness. It's really their ability to shoot content organically that resonates with what's going on in the world at this time. Yeah. So if you guys have ever seen at like videos on TikTok that look like TikToks, some of them look like ads, like, you know. You can't tell. That's that's a lot of UGC. <laughs> um, going back to influencers, uh, how is that different from UGC creators? Because I know there's a little bit of a difference there. Yeah, it, it now more than ever, honestly, like it's starting to blend together is how I kind of think about it. But everyone's going to have their own definition here. But for me, when I start to think of influencers, I think of it on a, a certain scale, right? So that could be an arbitrary number of like a Kim Kardashian level. It's like anyone with hundreds of millions of followers. Like they are now an influencer. Just with their being, they influence cultural norms. They influence trends, everything along those lines, right? A brand is also something I view as like an influencer. Weirdly, I don't know if others do, but it's just like they influence the decisions we make every single day. Whereas with a creator or user-generated content, what it is, it's more of like an expression of the brand. So it couldn't be like an individual person who alone might not have the influence, but paired with the brand and their storytelling ability are really able to make uh, the entire experience come to life. No, that's a good way to look at it. I actually didn't think about brand as influencer, but I mean, if you think about it, that's what they are, right? It's, yeah. It's I, I don't know if anyone will agree with me on that one, to be honest. I think like I just talked to my team about that, like in that lens. <laughs> so I just throw it out there sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I it's not something I thought about, but I see it, you know? true true um cool man well i think that's i I don't want to talk about like all these other creative metrics because that's going way too deep um but this is a nice way to jargon confuse the hell out of them (laughs) i'm joking (laughs) joking. unique ctr you know uh hook rate no (laughs) we'll say that for another time if you're interested you know go check out motion's website (laughs) but what i wanted to go into is this creative strategist role right I think this is a very interesting role. I think it's a role that a lot of people are like, huh, what is that? You know, mm-hmm. and it was funny. It was like before I, I talked with you, I was doing some research and this role has already existed, actually. You know, it's a role that's ex- existed in design. It's existed for brands. So um, when we talk about the creative strategist, we're talking about this in terms of the advertising side, you know, the, specifically in the paid social world. Um, so 
you know, when we think about um, the creative strategist role through that lens, how do you describe it to someone? You know, what is what is that role in your mind? Yeah, and I think the best way I can I can speak to the role is by painting the context of like why the role even exists in the first place. Like we started off the conversation Great. talking about like a media buyer, right? And a media buyer, the reason they exist is because there's advertising for distribution and someone needs to manage that process, right? So when we're thinking about a creative strategist and why that becomes important is um, now more than ever, the creative asset, so the image, video, carousel, whatever it might be, is the most important lever for success in all of paid advertising at the end of the day, right? But what we also know there is when we think about like creative strategy in general, as the, is that there's multiple people involved. So you know how everybody, I'd, mes I'd mentioned like media buyers first and foremost living in these platforms. Really, yep. these type of people share the trait of being like right-brained and data-heavy. Similar to market asked me, like, are you creative? I lean more data and right brain, in all honesty. Whereas the other side of things, we have creative folks, the people who are actually shooting these assets, editing these assets, making them come to life, who are exactly that, creative, and it lives on the left side of their brain. Because creative is the number one leverage for success in all of paid advertising, these two types of people should literally be in lockstep, side by side. Like they need to if you think about it, right? But the nature of when we think about human nature and how people are different, because of how they are and how successful they can be in their individual roles, there's this natural disconnect that's ultimately created. So the question then becomes, how can we easily marry all of the data that is contained within a media buyer's brain with all the creative juices that are in a creative person's brain? So when we're thinking about a creative strategist and what that is, what I really think about it as is like bridging that gap between the two teams. And then from that point, it's outlining and managing the process that allows for that gap to be bridged in the most efficient way. So that's the, that's the high level of how I describe what a creative strategist is. No, that's, that's really good. And when you think about the people that are successful in this role, you know, what are, what are they best at? Yeah, I think like, in all honesty, like any role, people can have their skews in terms of what they're great at, right? Like some people can be really great at research and understanding the psychology of what's going on um, within the world so they know what pain points to go after. Other people can be design heavy where they start to lean into like, okay, like this is the hook. This is the angle we're leveraging. Like this is how we can meet it with a look and feel, for example. But I think like what unifies the best creative strategist is actually managing that process that I just mentioned. So really how I view creative strategy is like a set number of activities where if you complete them, you are going to output the best creative possible very consistently. So just as a high level, everybody, like I know this is going to be a ton of bullets. I think it's around seven or eight steps. But yeah. when we think of the like the creative strategy process that's being managed here, what you're really doing is step number one is research. And that means you're building out, hey, what are people saying us saying about us in the world? What are our personas? What are the pain points people are experiencing that we help solve? All that good stuff. Step number two is ideation. And ideation is all about creating a backlog that serves those pain points that you had uncovered in research. So the question and conversation becomes, okay, based on our bandwidth and, re and uh, capabilities, like, do we create everything? Do we create some things? What do we ultimately want to do? After step number two of ideation, you move to step number three, which is arguably one of the most important steps. You now need to brief. It's not like you're alone in this game where you're going to be doing all this work. You're working with people along the way where you need to translate this information so it's quite digestible. Step number four, I got a bunch for you all. <laughs> step number four, you move to the actual content creation itself. So whether you're being a UGC creator and shooting some stuff, being a photographer, going out into the world, all that kind of stuff. Uh, step number five and six are more straightforward. It's like evaluate your creative to understand what's happened, uh, or evaluate to know if it's like good enough for your standards. And step number six is like launch it into your account. So like get it into those distribution channels. And then finally, step number seven, it's really just the evaluation. I call it creative analysis, but that's just a fancy way of saying we did all of this effort. We made all of this effort. Was it worth it? Did we do a good job? What are the numbers to prove it? So when to, to go back to answer the question, like what unifies the greatest creative strategists, it's being able to manage some version of that process in those seven steps that I mentioned uh, in a really efficient and a really well like decision, data-driven data driven, data -driven decision-making way. 
is how I think about it. Yeah. And that's where the marriage thing you were talking about too, right? That really helps um, left and right brain think, think together. And what I'm really curious about, <laughs> this is more of a personal question for me. I'm, I'm curious <laughs> on your take. Do you think that creative strategists should learn about media buying? Um, personal opinion, personal opinion, like I, I do, uh, the main reason being, and I think like, as I'm speaking it through as a creative strategist, I don't believe you have to learn media buying through and throughout. What I think it is, is understanding data. So do you have the data chops to be able to read it, analyze it and make decisions off of it? Right. So it's like, if you can actually read the data that informs the creative, that's the skill. I don't necessarily think it's like, what audience do I set? What is the, the type of optimization we're ultimately running? That kind of stuff. It's truly like, oh, this ad isn't getting sales. Why? It's like, oh, people aren't clicking on it. Okay, we need to add a CTA. And like, those are the type of inferences you can start to make along the way. So just being, being able to under, interpret data and just being a scientist about it. Yeah. Yeah. The three steps that I usually talk about when it comes to like data analysis is like, number one, there's data. It exists. Cool. Number two, you then have to analyze that data. So it just like makes a little bit more sense. And then once you've analyzed it, number three, what you're doing is you're moving it and you're making decisions. So it's like, what are the next steps? Who's ash actioning upon it? What is the output that comes of it? Um, so that's what data analysis breaks down into for me. Until I'm a process driven person. Like I think in, in buckets, I think in stages, like this is what yeah. I live. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, uh, when we had dinner that one time in San Francisco and you were just kind of blowing my mind, I was like, dude, I got to start thinking like this, you know, I come from wow, a freaking photography background. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, anyways, yeah, up, man, uh, you started videos. your own business and all that. Come <laughs> on, man. Don't, sh don't shoot yourself <laughs> short I'm, on that one. I'm a go getter, you know, let's see, you know. <laughs> But if you want to see more of Evan's face, go check out the YouTube um, channel, Motion Motion Analytics. I know there's two motions. I, there's like another Brutal. motion. It's like a Brutal yeah, SEO. Yeah, good Brutal SEO, right? SEO. <laughs> Terrible. But it's motionapp.com, folks. That's what you got to check out. Motionapp.com. Um, I would love to know like, if you've ever worked with junior teams, right? Because I know you've worked with agencies, uh, brands. For anyone that has like a junior team, maybe a couple junior buyers, you know, what can they do to level up? their career as a creative strategist? Yeah. The only reason I pause is because there's so many different like permutations of this. Like if it's junior teams and your team is small, it's one specific thing. If you're a part of a larger team and you're responsible for say like an internship program, it's a separate thing. Um, if it's you yourself are junior and everyone is junior around you, then it's a separate thing there. I think for this one, what I'll stick to is like more to, to what I, what I know. Uh, just from like the more recent experiences, it's just being in a situation where it's just like you're a small team and there are junior people. So I think like ultimately what you need to align on um, is that it's just going to take time. Like there's going to be a lot of effort that's involved to make it come to life. And then it depends like after that, like once you've aligned and you know that's going to happen and you have a smart person in the seat, it's just like what role are they holding, right? Are they a creative person? Are they creative brand? Are they a media buyer and they lean right? Or are they literally a creative strategist and they sit right in the middle there. And it's like, once you understand, you can start to build the appropriate plan. So when we talk about what um, like a creative strategist would start to do and like, where do we ultimately start the work on that front? I think a big place is just like the, the data, like kind of going back there. So if I'm working with a, a creative strategist, what I'll think through is, hey, not what do we go create tomorrow or what the heck should you have a UGC creator go make? I'll just start, start them on certain steps of the flywheel. So if I'm like, okay, I need to understand my pain points a little bit better for this brand, or it's like, I need to start building personas, which means like understanding competitors and all that work. I'll just give them a template. Dara has a great one. Shout out to Dara. Yeah, uh, and it's just like, Dara. go fill this out. Go fill this out. Like, go scan the web. Go look at our competitors. Go look at uh, ads library for different look and feels. Go look at our reviews. Go look at tag posts and build that out. It's a really good stepping stone to give someone the idea of the brain that they're getting into when they work for the specific brand. That's the first thing. And then those are data points in themselves of informing like what are the pain points we want to solve. And then the other place that I like to start with to really test the chops is the creative analysis stage. 
So mm -hmm. might have not contributed towards building out some creative along the way, but they can look at data. So it's like, hey, we ran these assets. We ran these videos. We ran these images. These are the data points I care about. Here's a video of me actually shooting it. Now go do your thing. Tell me what type of decisions you would make. And then we talk it through. And then the final thing I'd say here is just like after divvying up different stages, I did mention how this scenario is working in a smaller team where you have junior team members. Um, I did preach process a little bit earlier in terms of building this out. But I think if you are a part of the small team, what it really is, is like learning through osmosis. So it's like, keep that person as close to you as possible, right? When it's conversations you think they shouldn't be a part of because it's too high level or whatever it might be, bring them in. More context, the better to be able to understand what's going on. And really what you're doing is you're downloading how you think onto this person. So that just creates like an army of people who you can then delegate more work to. They rise up and crush along the way. So um, long answer, but I think short version of that is really like job itself. Understand that you can start with different stages of the, of the flywheel. And then from a mindset perspective, it's like learn through osmosis as well as be prepared for a little bit longer of a learning cycle. Oh, I love that. I was actually, uh, I actually asked Dara the same question and she gave me a pretty, pretty good tip. Um, one thing that I'm incorporating in our team is doing these things called like ad versus ad competitions. Nice. And so what I'll do is like, um, show a couple ads compete against each other and ask the team, like, which one do you think performed better and why just to get their creative juices going. I love that. Um, I love that. And so, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, we'll take those three points and put it on a on a poster somewhere. Come on, um, there you go. <laughs> so going back to the creative team, I mean, as you mentioned, you've worked with agencies, brands, um, you've talked to a ton of smart people. Um, at a high level, what makes a really good creative team? Oh, man. Um, I don't think this just applies to creative team members, right? Because like, I think a lot of people have spoken about this, but skill is one thing, right? Like you could be the best person in the world. I think of this in terms of basketball. I have the most skill in the mm -hmm. world, but you don't got a work ethic. It's not going to work out for you, unfortunately, right? So in general, um, the one caveat I'll add is like if you're truly in a bind and you need someone to pick up work tomorrow, it's like sometimes you got to pay a premium and just get the right person and like get that job done, right? So that's the one caveat. But in terms of a creative team, the transferable skill is just like curiosity, so the curiosity point is understanding like who the buyer is and the stuff you want to build, wanting to actually know more about the data so you can understand what to build. And that curiosity then drives them and leads to like ambition because all of a sudden, like how many times have creative folks just turned into pencil pushers? They kind of just say, okay, here's yep. a brief. Let me bang something out, make it happen. Cool. Here you go. Never think about it again. How, how, how demoralizing is that to just be in that cycle? You know what I mean? But the hope is, is with curiosity and like hiring through that lens, what you're able to do with the team members and team is empower them. So what that means is actually being able to say, all right, team, uh, we're in a spot where the assets you created, we can actually see performance against them now. And guess what, Judy, you have made the best creative this week, you generated the most money for this client. It's absolutely crushing it. Imagine how Judy feels, you know, it's like pumped up. It's like, what the heck? We make money around here. This is great. <laughs> And then the other team members want to strive for that. And the coolest thing is, is when you move it up the ladder, essentially what we're now doing is we're giving the creative team a voice. In too many orgs, creative teams just sit behind a desk and say like, yep, tell me what to do. My future is in your hands. All of the teams who get to make decisions are teams that hold numbers, whether it's revenue numbers or any type of number. So what we're doing in this case is we're able to, and I know this started as a team question, but we're able to empower these teams to actually put numbers beside their work so they can have a bigger seat at the table to determine the overall strategy of a company and no longer just be a pencil pusher. Like we could talk team structures in terms of how many videographers, how many photographers, how many editors. It's just really dependent on like budgets and output. But like when I'm thinking about curiosity, it's like, okay, not only are numbers available, it's like I have to have this want to like learn what that means. Like, like I need something in me to make me go get that. Right. So it's just like, I've, I've pegged it to be a certain level of curiosity, but it's also just like fire in the belly, belly intensity that also associated with those traits. How do you measure deep curiosity? How, how have you seen that? It's a really good question. 
I, I think of it, um, so different people are going to have different opinions here, but I think of it as if we're in an interview process, the types of questions people ask me. So it's just like, mm. what are they trying to learn? Are they truly in this interview as like a one way thing, like me pegging them with questions or do they want to know what we're about so I can give them the real, right? So when that piece of curiosity starts to come out, that's incredible. And then what I try to pair that with is during the actual like interview process itself, whether it be assignment or just questions I have, it's like, are they, do they have this intensity about them? This fire in the belly that just like showcases they want to go. Cause when you can pair them together, it's pretty great, but I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure like what I look for are the types of questions that someone's asking. And then based on my responses, how they, how they articulate it back to me or how they're actually making decisions off of that information. So it's like, Evan, how do you, how do you currently manage the team? And I might say something along the lines, especially early on, it's like, ooh, it's like a lot of like team building together. So what that means is like, I don't have the most time, like we're pretty strapped in bandwidth. So what that means is we want people to rise up to the occasion and like really grab this by the horns. And that person might be like, okay, sweet. So I can create this process. I can do this thing. I can make this come to life. And like, that's the energy. That's the energy I want to be able to around. Going back to the whole, you know, left brain, right brain thing. Have you seen someone's career? I know this could be an example or you can just kind of talk about it. But have you seen like a creative person who learned about the analytical side, just, just level the hell up? You know what I mean? They just got so good at what they do. Entirely. See it pretty frequently. And there's like yeah. two sides of the story here, which are so cool. So like from an example standpoint, like Savannah Sanchez's team is so impressive. Like they were all previously just creators. Now all of a sudden, like they're diving into the data and making decisions. It's like, damn, that's so cool, you know? But I think like the biggest piece for me of what I find the coolest and honestly most rewarding and fulfilling is, uh, is like the aspiration for creative folks. So what I mean mm. there is like the creative path is, a uh, I won't say daunting, but it can be like kind of capped in some worlds. Like you might be a designer, a senior designer, uh, and like, I don't know, design manager, if you want to go that route or whatever it might be. And a lot of the times you're like, ah, oh, do I really want to do this for the rest of my life? Do I really want to be like a pencil pusher and like kind of figure this stuff out this way? But we've had instances where it's just like, and it was again, super rewarding. We published an ebook called Becoming a Creative Strategist. And we had someone, uh, one of our clients reach out to us who was on the creative team. And it was like, felt stagnant in my career, wasn't too sure of what the next move is going to look like. And this gives, this has given me purpose and a path of what we can start to go after. And it's like, not only are you telling us that we can make and be creative and do the things that we want to do, but we can put numbers beside our work to make sure that we're valued in the same way a lot of these other teams are. So it's just like, Definitely examples, but when you pinpoint it to like someone's true emotion and giving them purpose, like so cool, man. So cool. You got to like push that ebook out to everyone, bro. Like Facts. that was like Facts. for me, I had my buddy, I was talking to you offline about this. Yeah. For him, that was kind of a turning point. He read the ebook. He's like, dude, I, I got to do this. <laughs> I got to What part about world. it? What part about it was like, oh, that's the turning point. I didn't ask him specifically, but he just, I think he just read maybe like the first several pages and talked about what a creative strategist is. Yeah. And it was kind of like a green light for him because he, mm -hmm. you know, he comes from like a traditionally trained photography background. Um, he's a, you know, he's not a high level marketing person, but you know, he's, he's done organic for this, for the company he's working for. And then he does photography on the side, but he realizes that he can marry the two of those, mm -hmm. right. For a role. And he doesn't know how to get there. Cause it's like, he, you know, he doesn't, ha he doesn't have the budgets to work with the media buying stuff. He's just learning yeah. paid social. Yeah. And it's like, you know, who, who can I lean on to? Right. And I think, um, I feel like you guys are kind of building that, which is kind of cool. Right. A lot of people that, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you right now, like that, like I said, that ebook got him really curious. Um, not, not giving any business ideas, but you know, like it would be kind of cool to, to, to find, to, to help those people out more, you know? Most definitely. Most definitely. Well, how did you, how did you end up on the agency side, Mark? Cause like technically speaking, like I talk about Savannah's team. I talk about like the example of someone reaching out to me, but like you fall into this bucket too, you know? I, I do. I do. I mean, creative strategy is my role. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, just to give you a little bit of background, I, I landed on the agency side from a, from a, like a, like a close friend, uh, someone in network, you know, I just liked posting on Instagram, great storyteller there. 
post my photography you know there was a golden age of uh instagram where you know people <laughs> grew and were shooting like you know like uh places where they traveled and stuff um yep. some guy was like hey i like the way you write your captions on instagram <laughs> you want to join an agency <laughs> and i was like well at the time i was working at like a recycling company had no idea what i wanted to do and um yeah i i you know i thank that guy every day you know he kind of changed my life and uh, <laughs> that you know i learned facebook ads through him lead gen um and the rest was history and then i just started to learn i found dara's youtube videos found you and uh, now we're here that's incredible man that's incredible. There's something about putting yourself out there. That's the common thread though, right? Because it's just like you had started yeah. just by posting what you have going on, which landed this opportunity in your lap. And then from there, you had um, like the go-getter fire in the belly piece, like to actually go and research of how to get better at these things. So I think like when we're thinking about people, you had asked me the question is like, what have you seen anyone do this? And then the next question for me, for you is like, well, how do, how do people do this? And like, that's the blueprint, man. Like put yourself out there. Like if it's in your world, master your domain first, like get busy and like post everything that you have. Uh, and then you have a portfolio that you can start reaching out to people with, or hopefully someone lands in your lap. But there's some stuff, some stuff people can do. I'm curious to know, you know, since you're starting to hire now, like, what do you think about personal brands? Do you think that helps out a lot? And in a career? Yeah, it's never negative. It's never, ever negative. Like personal brand gives you the power to start to dictate like where you would want to work, right? And gets like, instead of you putting in all the effort to, to write applications, get out there, that kind of stuff. It's just like people come to you and it's just like, hey, like see you posting about this. You're the expert in the space. Like, awesome. Like, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. So I, I literally think it never hurts the candidate. I tend to be that type of person, by the way. <laughs> I consider myself kind of a renaissance man, just kind of doing a lot. Um, oh but I got a really go. good piece of advice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a really good, good piece of advice from Michelle, Type Dream, tech startup founder. And she was like, you should always be learning, know how to do th new things. The, the problem now is, or not even the problem, but the solution is you got to make sure you do that thing for a long time before you quit, mm. right? Um, because if you're going to do something for like two weeks, like that means nothing, right? Do it for like a month or two and, and then you and then you kind of like reflect. It's kind of like a yeah. creative test, right? <laughs> you can't for run sure. it for a few days, you know? <laughs> and it's also it's also it's also uh, like make it bite sized because sometimes people try to, to yeah. do too much and it's overwhelming and you feel defeated, right? But it's like how can we um like literally make it so it's so simple we could do it every day? Like for me, meditation was a thing that I put off yeah. for a long time and I'm just like, man, I can't sit here for ten minutes. You tell me crazy to figure this stuff out. But I made it simple. Like I started with literally two minutes, two minutes every day. And now I'm back up to 10. And like, that's how I get my day started every single time. Stuff like that. And I know like the CEO of Manulife, he always used to say, learn one new thing every day. Because by the time the year passes, you've learned 365 new things <laughs> and someone that's else advice. hasn't learned anything. Right. So it's just like bite sized, bite sized, make it easy. I love that. Um, I, I could talk about this all day. You know, I think wellness is so important in our industry, just yeah, not man. being hard on yourself. Right. Um, and that could, I, would, you know, I think that could be a separate conversation because when I came back from this, you know, I came back from this little like agency thing. Um, there's this guy named, uh, I think Daniel Octon, um, who also owns an agency. And that, you know, out of all the things he put on his slide for the presentation, the one that stuck out to me was just his mental health, right. Is take a vacation if you need to you know, have a business that works for you, not against you. Um, and yeah, I mean, don't work for the sake of work, you know, especially in this industry where, especially as a creative strategist, where you're using your brain fully, like, man, that is right. I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think again, the mental health thing is something that like I'm super passionate about and like understanding the way your own brain works to also be able to come up with these decisions. Cause I know like for my path in particular, there was a time when you just kind of had to eat shit for a while, like do the hard work, yeah, that's the reality. work those hours. Yeah. And it's like, it gives you the freedom over time. Right. But it's like intentionally do that. Don't necessarily sign up for something you didn't know what it was going to be. It's like intentionally put yourself in those spots. I appreciate you sharing some of your story. I know we were talking about um, <laughs> creative strategy. Uh, we'll we'll hop, go, go hop back in there. Um, yeah. Creative analytics, 
So, I mean, obviously you guys, one of those platforms that offers that there's a ton of different analytics, organic analytics, um, you know, paid social, I think for a lot of people, like the numbers look cool, but it can also paralyze them, right? Trying to figure out what decisions to make next. Uh, I mean, personally for me, I obviously we're in this, so we, we know what metrics to look at. Um, but when you think about like creative analytics, um, like what's actually important and what's vanity, when I say vanity, what's not important, how do you, how do you think people should think about creative analytics in the right way? Yeah. Yeah. So the purpose of paid advertising in general is like sales and driving money. So it's always going to come back to your CAC or customer acquisition cost. It's going to come back to your return on investment or return on ad spend. It's going to come back to your uh, marketing efficiency. So you just want to like know those things for sure. But specifically, since we're talking about creative strategists, I think one of the big things is just like, there's a ton of metrics that you can pick from. Like what are the most important for me at the end of the day? Right. So what you're looking for is ultimately the relationship between engagement metrics and those conversion metrics. So from there, what you can do, um, I don't know how deep you want me to go on metrics here. When I think of analytics. As much as you want. No worries. Okay. It could be, it could be like the example if we're talking about making a video and that video is 30 seconds, right? Oftentimes, if we just think, did people buy or not? It's like, okay, cool. That means we're very binary and we say thumbs up, it did good. Or thumbs up, it did not do well. Um, but the good thing about creative analytics is it gives more color than such a basic answer. So you know exactly what to do next. So instead of just like, did it do well or did it not do well? You can actually say like, okay, this ad did not generate as many purchases as I thought, but I'm looking at a metric here that we call the thumb stop ratio or the hook rate. And that metric tells us how many people have actually stopped in their feed to watch the first three seconds of this video. And why that's so important for everyone listening in, it's like you need someone to stop their scrolls in their feed before they click, before they buy anything at the end of the day. So what this context gives me is like, let's say my purchases and my return isn't exactly where I want it to be. And I have a super low thumb stop ratio. What that tells me is like, oh, how am I going to get purchases? I'm not even getting enough people to stop for my video. So now when we're thinking about what to do next, it's not simply, ah, didn't do well, can it? It's like, ah, it didn't do well, and here's an opportunity to make it better. All we're going to do is swap out what we're using for those first three seconds so we give it a better shot to get more people involved and hopefully push people down the funnel to purchase. So that's like an example of how this story like compounds and ultimately gives more color into the grand scheme of things. Is there a place where people can if they wanted to dive into creative metrics, is there something that you guys have that, that you can share? We have a metric glossary. It's like the most important stuff you need to know. Not everything, <laughs> but just like the simplified stuff. I don't know if we have show notes or anything, but I can send that over. I, there will be show notes it. on Spotify. Yeah, right, yeah. if cool. it's free, then that'd be cool. If not, and they got to do something, yeah, let me know too. No, no, it's all free. It's just like a spreadsheet people can access. There, I mean, yeah, there's some, there's some data people in here that would probably love that. <laughs> cool, awesome. Um. Where do you think creative analytics will look like in a couple of years? It's a really good question and it's going to be evolving quite a bit. Like where my, where my head originally, uh, or off gut goes is like a conversation about AI, right? Like yeah, I think yeah. a lot yeah. of, I think a lot of creators, uh, or just like anyone who's tuning in, like, I think a lot of people, when they first think of creative, it's just like, okay. These things are just going to do everything. They're going to make the assets. They're going to analyze the assets and like things are going to happen along the way. Right. But the main thing when it comes to AI is all about how does it, how does it simplify the pain points and let humans do what they do best at the end of the day. So a clear example of that, um, I'm deviating a little bit, but a clear example of what I call out with like AI and what's been working well is like Facebook itself. A lot of the times anyone in this world, we toss around the term, the algorithm all the time. You know what I mean? And with the mm -hmm. algorithm, what that really is, is like AI's learning capability. The algorithm is doing a good job at determining who is most likely to complete the action you want. If that's a sale, great. The algorithm is going to find out who wants to buy this thing and make sure we get in front of them. If it's a landing page view, amazing, even better. The algorithm is going to find people to drive to the landing page. So that's an example of like AI making things easier for people. So when we talk about what is creative analytics as we move forward, 
I think there's just going to be like a lot more placements with the evolving of just what the world is. So whether it be metaverse type of shit or whatever it is, like there could be more, <laughs> yeah. more and more to analyze there. But ultimately, when I think of AI and creative analytics, I'm not worried. I more so think of creative strategists in a good spot where they're just going to have like data readily available to them. So they're not searching and spending so much of their time like searching for information. It's solely decision making focused. It's like, hey, pull my top 10 reviews. Amazing. It's like, okay, like pull the creatives that have worked the best for us in the past 40 days. So we see and get inspiration that way. Fantastic. What are my personas that are ultimately resonating the best? Perfect. And then from there, we can pr brief it out. And I think I, this is a personal belief. I don't think like AI and the, the creation of assets is ever going to replace humans. Like there's something about like creative being so emotional and like attached to humans at the end of the day. Sure. And I think what's ultimately going to happen there is that, um, the analytics being easier to access will therefore make more intelligent briefs and those briefs will be able to produce faster where creative people can then like action upon it a lot easier. They might have tools available to them that like allows that to be a, like a quicker create or a better create, uh, but not replacing the people along the way. So that's like kind of how I think about things. That's it. <laughs> no, man, I think AI is extremely important to think about, especially your industry, my industry, like, Most and I definitely. feel like AI is kind of in the middle for 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 marketers like they like it or they don't i met a guy that's creating a, a video platform where you can create video ads using prompts it's pretty crazy he's a good that's he's actually cool. a good friend of mine um and so i think about that too and it's like does it replace creative work or does it enable right and it sounds like you're on the enable side 100 percent, 100 percent. i want to talk about career a little bit i know we talked a lot creative creative analytics um, but let's talk about career and being a millennial, because this is a millennial <laughs> method podcast. So, I mean, you're you're a millennial, man. Uh, 30s, right? You're in your 30s? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. How does it feel to be 30 in your 30s? Feels great. I've I've never I've never really feared age. I kind of just like view it as um, would I trade my life now for what it was 10 years ago or anything along those lines. And so far, like I have the answer hasn't been yes by any means. So in that sense, it feels really great. Um, in other senses, it's just like kind of like cool to make it to past 30. It's just like a lot of people, I won't say a lot, but like people aren't always uh, provided the opportunity to. So it's just like grateful to be here type of thing. Uh, but yeah, man, overall feels good. Feels good. Did you imagine that you'd be in this spot, this career? I don't know if I ever had a blueprint for like what I wanted my career to be, let's say. Like, I think for me, the biggest thing was just like, uh, it kind of started with the mental health stuff and like unpacking like what I wanted to do and what brings me joy, right? Yeah. So I think for me, I was always told growing up, like work in your passion, work in your passion. And that was always quite confusing to me, if I'm being completely honest, because like passion is often associated with a like a tangible thing. Right. So it's like basketball, like that was my thing growing up, or it's like yeah, photography or something along those lines. And for me, I'm like, realistically, I can't make this my job. Like, let's be real. If I want to put food on the table, it's going to be hard. So it's like, what does that mean? Right. So I got to the place of like, when I started mapping what my career meant, it wasn't like this level, this job, this place uh, by any means. It came down to like what made me happy. I really view passion as like an emotional response of an action that you do. So it's just like, what gives me the most joy? Oh, solving hard problems. I get a lot of fulfillment from putting, putting and make, or putting numbers on the board, making an impact that's actually tangible to a business. I get a lot of fulfillment through. So for me, what it was, was just optimizing my career for more situations like that. And the cool thing was, is it gave me a lot of freedom. Like I know a lot of people who felt like handcuffed to saying, I need to work for this type of company. I need to work for Apple or, or whatever it might be. Whereas for me, I kind of just looked in the mirror and like, I can kind of do this anywhere in all honesty. So as long as I do a good job, hopefully things come. But as long as I'm doing those things, I'll be fulfilled ultimately. So that's kind of how I viewed my path. And I think just by doing good work, I've been lucky a lot of the times to land in the spots I have. I think you're totally right about the passion thing. It's kind of a confusing like thing to to at to tell someone, right? Because you can be passionate about what like video games, <laughs> like Counter Strike or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is that gonna make you money? Um, yeah. 
I love what you said about uh, the first principles, though. Like, what do you actually enjoy? I like enjoying so hard problems, right? Or solving solving hard problems. I think yeah. that's something that people should think about more than than trying to follow their passions. Yeah. And then it's like, what's the emotional response? Because then like, you truly know if it's really, if it's really like something you enjoy, if you just have yeah. like an overwhelming sense of like fulfillment at that point, right? Like when I look at basketball earlier in my life, like basketball, I always said was something I was passionate about, but really what it was, it was like the camaraderie. Like I miss mm. being a part of a team. I miss being around my guys. Right. And like, it wasn't the actual sport playing it there. Like it was really working towards a common group, a common goal with like a close knit group of guys at that point. So it's like, as soon as I realized that, I kind of felt super empowered for what career could mean for me and like un unpacking it that way. What was your childhood dream growing up? Was it basketball? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I thought I was, I thought I was going to the league, like for sure. <laughs> I was like, I'm making but it. But no, I think, yeah. it. <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, what do, you, what do you think that says about you? Just just having that part, that that dream? Uh, that's a really good just question. Just hanging out with your boys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's just like a kid growing up, like who plays sports. Like, it's just something to to attach yourself to. And like, that's the, the best league in the world. So it's just like an easy thing to kind of point to. And sports is always good. Like, it teaches you a lot of lessons around discipline, um, like, showcases competitiveness if you have that in you uh, and just like forming relationships with people and how to operate in a high performing environment so um i wouldn't have worded that way as a kid but now looking back i'm like damn i learned a lot of lessons i learned a lot of lessons it was very helpful right it's kind of like it says something about you because when you're a kid that's what you you think you like and then when you get when you get older you could kind of phrase it how you how you see it when you look back yeah. But I think there's also like the defining moments, right? Cause like basketball for me, as much as it was like a tool to allow me to, to learn new things, like whatever it might be, I think it's also just shaped so much of who I am, right? The way I talk yeah. is part of it. My friends are the things that I like. Like, of course there's a natural alignment, but it also like shapes into who you are as a person, which is the same thing with career, right? Like as much as like we own it, the situations around us are also going to shape us into the humans we are. So it's like having to be aware of both sides, a little bit of a tangent again, but it's like, if you purely operate of joy and like you're in a scenario, you might be around people who are quite toxic, even though you're self-fulfilled, it's just like shaping you into a person. So it's like, that's why it's so challenging nowadays, right? Like you could take one box, yeah. but there's a million other ones to also figure out. This reminds me of when we had our dinner in San Francisco, the little end of it, just having, having these talks, man. I love, I love it. I love your yeah, perspective, man, man on life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have the best perspectives, but it's worked for me. It's worked for me. Like it's, I don't know. Stuff like hey, this well, is so I personal. Up to you, man. You know? Yeah. No, I, I appreciate that perspective. And, you know, for the people, and we know this because we're in marketing, but we're always just trying to figure it out, especially in our industry. Facts. <laughs> Attribution, you know, like all this other stuff. We're, we're all just literally just trying to figure it out. And yeah. so, you know, I want, I'd love to know, like for the people that are kind of lost in their life, any advice for them? You know, any other advice for people that are feeling lost? Yeah. Um, it's, first thing is like, it's tough. I've been there. It sucks. Like it's a dark cloud. Like I'm with you. I'm with you. You'll see the light soon. Like that's the first thing. But I think like beyond that as a, as a to do tomorrow, I'm a big fan of like energy audits at the end of the day. Mm, it's like when yeah, you're yeah. doing tasks, it's outlining. Did this give me energy? Is it neutral? Did it take energy? Like am I drained? Right. So when you're going through the tasks related to your job, your life, whatever it might be, whatever it might mean, like audit the crap out of that. Because at the end of the day, you might see certain things are giving you that joy and everything else isn't. It's like, that's what I have to lean in. And then what you do is unpack what about that is giving you joy. The same way that Mark and I had discussed, like, okay, like what are we actually doing and what is the fulfillment level that I'm feeling there? But I will say though, if you do an energy audit and every single thing is negative and draining you, like you're in a dark cloud moment. Like that's a, that's yeah. not, not even to be la like funny though. Like, like that's tough, like for real. And at that point I would honestly say like, I know people probably don't want to hear it from me. It's just like go to therapy or something like, like learn, mm. learn more about yourself. Like, why do you feel this way? Like, why are you wired this way through your experiences in life? Cause with knowledge comes power. Like everybody says. So at least if you know why you're starting to feel these things, you can start to deal with them. 
moving forward. So the immediate term is literally like energy audit yourself. If everything's bad, like talk to your friend groups, talk to people in your lives to just like try to get a sense of why you might be feeling this way and gain camaraderie in other ways. And then once you're in a spot or if it's like you don't want to do any of that woohoo stuff, um, yeah. <laughs> all I'd say is all I'd say is just try new things, right? I think Mark talked about it earlier. It's important to continue to try new things. It's important to learn new things. It's like if you have the energy and you feel motivated, because again, that dark cloud's powerful. I get it. So if you do have the energy and power, like just start with one new thing a day. And when we're thinking about like creative strategy in our worlds, what I'd say is a really easy step is what Mark said. Like, I like what Dara told him, like go to Facebook ad library, check that thing out and like formulate an opinion around an ad. And then you know who you can message? You can message me and Mark. You can be like, hey guys, <laughs> like I was listening to this thing. Like I think this, this and this about the ad. Like, what do you guys think? And then we're starting to learn. Right, you build up the confidence and you continue to go through. So uh, I don't know if it's the best advice in the world, in all honesty, but like that's where my head goes. That's where my head goes. I think it's a great way to close, man. I think uh, the energy audit. I remember when we had our San Francisco dinner. That's the one thing I took away, and I actually mm. did the audit like a month later. Mm. I was like, "What the hell am I trying to? What's giving me energy?" Right. <laughs> And here we are, man. Like it's it's pretty crazy. I I appreciate you sharing that, really. And, Most definitely. Um, so Evan's what happened right. like, when you when you audited up? it? What happened? Like was it the was it was it everything was like kind of brutal? Was it some things you loved, other things you didn't? Yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's just me as a person, but I'm like ninety percent happy with my life right now. And so yeah, I'm fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the problem is now is like maybe I'm too happy in too many things. <laughs> You know, like <laughs> my, 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 uh, my happiness is like a pie that's cut mm. in like six or seven ways. And honestly, this is a great point that you bring up because, um, creative people, man, they, they love doing all kinds of things. It's kind of mm. a problem we have, right? <laughs> we love to dabble like photo, video, drawing, like dancing people that are inherently creative know what I'm talking about. And um, I think it's I think it's something that we just got to deal with as human beings. But hundred uh, percent, especially when you're a creative person, like it, like it's so easy to get pulled one way or the other. Like business is easier because, like, what I usually say is, is like, okay, like yeah. based on your goals, like in life, like what type of life do you want to live? Are you going to optimize for dollars? Is it a balance between things? Like, kind of go that route. But through another lens, it's a little bit more challenging. Like. I'd say it still comes down to what do you want to do and what gives you freedom, but I don't know. Different strokes for different folks. Evan, always a great time. I really appreciate your time. And I know you've been a busy person, but honestly, these catch-ups to me are like, I, I tell I tell people all the time, I have this guy that I work with. He's kind of like my homie, right? Like he's just he's just one of the homies, even though he's from Canada, he's, he's a Canadian homie. Um, but uh, nah, man, I really appreciate you. None. Most definitely, man. No, it's likewise. It's only love. It's only love. I'm so happy I got to, to be on your show, man. You're big time now. I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I ain't no Tim Ferriss yet. You know, we'll, we'll get there. We'll <laughs> soon, see. soon, 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 soon. Everybody tuning in. You're early. You're early. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Where, where can people find you? Anywhere you'd like. No, I'm joking. Just uh, if you're interested in following and learning more about creative strategy, like hit me on Twitter. It's uh, EvMKLee. Um, hit me on LinkedIn. I'm posting all the time there more frequently than Twitter in all honesty. Um, and beyond that, if you want to learn more about motion and creative strategy in general, check out our website, motionapp.com. We have a lot of downloadable content that you can check out that I'm hoping adds a ton of value. And it will. So yeah. Awesome. All right, brother. Well, it's good seeing you, man. Well, Catch you later. Appreciate you, Mark. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to Spotify or Apple. Uh, that's where we host this podcast. And I really appreciate you listening. It truly means the world. And I wish you a happy and healthy, wealthy life. I'll see you at the next one. Cheers.